Well, we're coming up on the end of our Pleasing God series this summer. Um, these are going to be the last two sermons that we're going to be doing this week and, Lord willing, next week in Hebrews 13. Um, I've entitled these two messages, 10 Practices of a God-Pleasing Church, and we'll do five this week, and, Lord willing, we'll do five next week. And then we'll wrap up for this series. Um, just a quick review of where we've been just to survey the landscape once again. Um, this summer, we've been looking at the theme, um, as you know, of, of pleasing God, and we've been trying to do it from four, sort of four different angles using the analogy of a, of a home or a house. We, in the first three sermons of the series, we laid the foundation of what it means to please God. We looked at Colossians chapter 1, and where Paul talks about a life fully pleasing to God. We looked at 2 Corinthians 5, where Paul said we make it our aim to please him so that pleasing God is a, is a possible pursuit for us. And then in the third sermon, we looked at what the will of God is and how to understand that from Scripture. And we said that God has both a secret plan, but also he has revealed commands, and both of those are part of his will. So that sort of served as the foundation for the series in those first three sermons. Then in the next two sermons, we looked at what I would call the framework, where we, where we really understood what's critical to pleasing God is both faith and dependence on him and also the gospel. Because apart from the good news of Jesus Christ and faith in that, we can't begin to pursue a life pleasing to God. So we talked about the importance of the gospel and faith in our pursuit of pleasing God. And then the, the last four sermons have really been the heart of the series where we've looked at what we've called the furniture in the house. And those have been the, the four phrases in the New Testament where the will of God is clearly expressed, both concerning our salvation our sanctification, our spirituality, or being spirit-filled, and then last week, being submissive. And so we come this week to the furnishings. Heath Dame has already given us one of them uh, in his sermon in Romans 14 when he talked about the difference between or how to please God and please people and how we think through that biblical tension. And now we're going to look at 10 practices of a God-pleasing church in Hebrews 13. You might be thinking, well, why do we pick Hebrews 13? Well, in this chapter, no less than three times, the theme of pleasing God is brought up. I want to show you those three times quickly before we dive in. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, where the writer to the Hebrews says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable or pleasing worship with reverence and awe. So that really the instructions that are to come, and also in chapter 13, verse 16, the writer says, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So he's brought up the theme of pleasing God again. And he, he concludes with another word on pleasing God in verse 21, where in the, in the process of this benediction, this closing prayer of the letter, the writer says, may God equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. So Clearly, when we're talking about Hebrews 13, we're talking about the heart of what it means to please God as a local church. So we're going to look at these 10 practices and talk about, on, on a, in a very practical way, I trust, what it looks like to please God as a church. So let's look at these first five um, this morning. First one, a God-pleasing church loves each other. A God-pleasing church loves each other. This is where we start in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1, where the writer says, let brotherly love continue. Now, if you think about this, why does he say that first? Well, he doesn't tell us here of why he tells it first. But I think we can make the assumption that a lot of New Testament writers, when it comes to Christian ethics, when it comes to how to live as a Christian, the very first thing that whether Paul or Peter or any other apostle, John, would talk about is the centrality of love. Scripture tells us over and over again that love is the ultimate virtue. Remember 1 Corinthians 13, right? Where Paul tells us, the, the church at Corinth that if we don't have love, we not only gain nothing, we are nothing. We can be accomplishing good things in life and doing all kinds of right things like attending church and serving in ministry and studying scripture and praying daily and feeding the hungry and helping the weak and preaching solid theology and correcting bad theology and leading people to Jesus. And you can do all that without love, all of it, and still be missing the mark. 
But I think it's interesting here that he doesn't just say, love each other. That's not the first command. He says, let brotherly love continue, which I think implies two things. Number one, they're already loving each other, which is a great thing. It's true of us by God's grace as well. We love one another. But he says, let it continue. Now, why does he have to say that? Because, brothers and sisters, as you well know, love ain't natural. Even to us, as born again, spirit and dwelt, new creation in Christ. It's not natural. Now, at, at our deepest, in our deepest regenerated condition, we love. We are. We are lovers of God and lovers of people. But there is enough remaining sin in us to make that a battle every single moment of every single day. Love is hard, and it requires us to actively resolve to not give up on each other. That's the tendency in the church, to quit on each other. And so Paul, or the writer of the Hebrews, has to say, let brotherly love continue. Now, you know that many who are disillusioned with the church today romanticize the early church. Maybe you've heard this statement. I know I have as a pastor that if we could just get back to that New Testament Christianity, things would be a lot better. It's a, it's a way of romanticizing the early church and not realizing how broken things were back then as well. If we could only get back to the way things used to be, the sentiment goes, then I'd want to join a church. But frankly, I can't find a church that lives like the church enough to want to join it, says a lot of people. And I always scratch my head when I hear Christians say that, because in several incident, incidences, the New Testament church, the actual New Testament church in the New Testament is less attractive, less authentic, less flexible, less loving, less truthful, less beautiful, and less Christ-like than much of the church today. It is. Read the letters. <laughs> if anyone has ever been tempted to hit the eject button on the local church and not let brotherly love continue, it was the people who were part of the actual New Testament church. As the most prominently represented New Testament church, let's take the church at Corinth as an example. Corinth was a dysfunctional mess. Factions, harshness, divisions, adultery, lawsuits, Divorce, elitism, classism, and neglect of the poor were just some of the issues. In Corinth, brotherly love had all but been hijacked. They were judging each other. They were dividing over minor doctrinal differences. They were suing each other. They were divorcing without biblical grounds. They were parading their Christian liberty before those who had tender consciences. They were ignoring the poor and needy in their midst, and they were drawing lines around the Lord's Supper that were tighter than the lines that were drawn by Jesus, excluding those from his table that he was eager to include. You know the famous love chapter that we share at weddings a lot, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8? You know the context of that is written not so much as a commendation but as a rebuke? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not, is not easily angered. That was written as a rebuke to the church at Corinth because they were not behaving that way. They were not displaying those characteristics. But what does Paul do with this church? He lets brotherly love continue. He begins his confrontational first letter to the Corinthians not with condemnation, but with affirmation. In spite of their many flaws, their sins, their inconsistencies, their hypocrisies, and their weaknesses, Paul the Apostle was hopeful for this church. Not because they were stellar people, but because Jesus was a stellar Savior. <laughs> Shockingly, Paul never gave up on Corinth. Instead of walking away, he leaned in. As he sharply corrected them, he also encouraged, affirmed, loved, prayed for, and thanked God for them. Like Jesus, he saw a broken church and envisioned beauty. He saw a sinful church and he envisioned sainthood. He saw a band of misfits 
but he envisioned a radiant, perfected bride. He saw a caterpillar, he envisioned a butterfly. And he knew that God wanted him to participate in loving this church to life. As St. Augustine once said, sometimes the church is a whore, but she's still our mother. Not only is the church our mother, she's also Jesus' wife and Jesus' bride. Would any of us dare turn our backs on the bride that he loves? Ray Ortland says, Even those of us who have been wounded by the church stick with the church because of God's commitment to the church. If your relationship with the church is ambiguous and sporadic and subject to convenience, the problem is not your relationship with the church. The problem is your relationship with Christ. He has made his loyalty clear. Our first step toward revival is recommitment to our own membership vows. God has made a vow, and he's calling us to join him in his resolve. Let brotherly love continue. Brothers and sisters, are you? Are you letting brotherly love continue, or has it stopped somewhere along the way? Has it reached the point of no return? Has it reached the point of this far and no farther? I've done all that I'm going to do. I'm done with so-and-so. I'm done with them. No, we need to let brotherly love continue because a God-pleasing church loves each other. Number two, a God-pleasing church cares for the needy. A God-pleasing church cares for the needy. Look at verse two and three. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. No doubt a reference to Genesis 18 there. If you're not familiar with that story, you can go back and read it later. Verse 3, remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them and those who are mistreated since you also are in the body. So this is a logical second practice that the writer presses upon the church because this is one way in which brotherly love continues. I mean, who are the most difficult people to love? The needy. (laughs) We're needy but we find it difficult to love needy people. And nobody's more needy than the stranger or those who are in prison. The author of Hebrew fires two more quick commands in our direction when he says, don't forget and remember these people. Both charge us to help those in need, though two different groups are in view, strangers and prisoners. Now, throughout the Old Testament, these two categories of the stranger and the prisoner are just given as, as, as examples of neediness. This, but, but it's not limited there. The, the Lord declares all throughout the Old Testament that authentic faith fights injustice, it liberates the oppressed, it relieves burdens, it feeds the hungry, it shelters the poor, it clothes the naked. Moses said that if there are any poor among us, we should be open-handed and give generously and never begrudgingly, and we should give until the need is met. James, the half-brother of Jesus, in his letter, wrote that religion that is true and that God accepts is kind and looks after widows and orphans in their distress. Now, I want you to turn with me quickly. Hold your finger in Hebrews 13, but I want, to, I want you to go back to an Old Testament text that's very, very relevant to this issue in Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah 58. We're going to come right back to Hebrews 13 in a moment. But I want you to see, when I was reading this text again recently, I was just struck by a number of things I hadn't seen before that I'd like to show you this morning. We're just going to look at part of Isaiah 58, beginning at verse 1, and we'll go down through about verse 11 before we pop back over to Hebrews 13. Now, look at verse 1. Isaiah says, Cry aloud, do not hold back, lift up your voice like a trumpet, declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Now, what do you expect to read next? Right? Like, what's coming? There's something big coming. You think he's going to talk about how they trash every single one of the Ten Commandments on a regular basis. No, look at verse 2. They seek me daily. What? 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 No, 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 no. You don't rebuke people who seek God. <laughs> you rebuke people for not seeking God. But he says, they seek me daily. They delight to know my ways. 
as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They draw, they delight to draw near to God. They, they, they love going to church. They, they seek God daily, not even apart from church. They're reading their Bibles. They're praying. If you move to a new town and you found a new church that sought God daily, delighted to know his ways, asked God for righteous judgments, and delighted to draw, him, draw near to him, you'd join that church, and so would I. But Isaiah might not. Isaiah might not. You think, well, why wouldn't he join it? Because it's possible for a church to do all these good things with no awareness that to God something is deeply, deeply wrong. Look at verse 3. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no acknowledge, no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppose all your workers. See, these people have been fasting, but they were doing it for their own selfish reasons. The product of their fasting is dumping their frustrations on God. How can they be so godly before God and so angry with God at the same time? It's because their piety was a way of manipulating, pressuring, and obligating God. And when their religious practices didn't leverage the cooperation from God that they wanted, they resented God. Now, brothers and sisters, that kind of stuff's in us too. That kind of stuff is in us too. What poisoned their souls was not their sin, it was their religion. Where did they go wrong? Look back at verse 2 again. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that did righteousness. That as if is very important. As if. They weren't really righteous. They were, they, they were pretending. There was an external conformity, but there was not an inward desire. Now look at the second half of verse 3 again. Behold, in the day of your fast you seek your own pleasure, and you oppress all your workers. See, you can be fasting and victimizing at the same time. That can go on at the same time. Okay, Fasting does not rid a heart of the tendency to hate people. Sometimes it can intensify it. See the Pharisees. The, the point is their fasting was leading them to not care about the needy among them. If our Christianity doesn't move us to make our world a better place, especially our brothers and sisters' lives, then it's not only unhelpful to others, it's displeasing to God. See, privatization of faith is actually faithlessness. Jonathan Edwards wrote about this when he said, Christian love disposes a person to be public-spirited. A man of a right spirit is not a man of narrow and private views, but is greatly concerned for the good of the community to which he belongs, and particularly of the city where he resides. This is why Isaiah calls us to take responsibility for our surroundings. You see this in verse 6. He says, Is this not the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness and to undo the straps of the yoke and let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? See, following God, according to Isaiah, isn't some sort of religious joyride. It, it gets us busy. It gets us busy seeking to relieve suffering, especially eternal suffering. So while we preach the gospel centrally and primarily, we also care about people's real physical needs. Poverty, illiteracy, abortion, sex trafficking, injustice, and people going to an eternal hell. And here's the promise when we live that way. Look at verse 8. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear, rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry, and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness, and your gloom be as a noonday, and the Lord will guide you continually, and satisfy your desire and 
scorch places and make your bones strong, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Brothers and sisters, do we want God to answer our prayers? Do we want God, as soon as we call, the Lord say, here I am. Here I am, ready to answer. Then we got to live this way. This is what draws God's attention. We have to be, if we want God to answer our prayers, we need to be willing to be his answer to somebody else's. Do you want God to come and say to you, here I am? Then get close to somebody who needs you and say, here I am. And here's another promise. If you're gloomy or struggling, there could be complex reasons for that. But one remedy is to find someone who's needy and pour yourself out for them. This is the way John Newton helped William Cooper out of his funks a lot of times. They both wrote great hymns. John Newton wrote Amazing Grace. William Cooper wrote There's a Fountain Filled with Blood. God Moves in a Mysterious Way and a number of other great hymns. But William Cooper struggled struggled with the privatization of his faith and was deeply introspective and always concerned about whether he was right with God and wondering. And Newton, the way he counseled him was, brother, you need to get out of your house and go love somebody else. And he would often take him on pastoral calls with him and bring him around. And the purpose of that was so that he could experience something of the the Isaiah 58 blessing of having his darkness lifted by being able to put his head on the, bill, the, the bed at night on his pillow, exhausted and exhilarated, that he poured himself out for the sake of the Lord and his people. May the Lord help us to do that. There's a great blessing promised when we pour ourselves out for those who are needy. Now, the writer to the Hebrews, back in Hebrews 13 now, reminds us to not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Why does he have to say that? Well, because... Hospitality is always, according to the New Testament, somewhat inconvenient, right? This is why Peter has to say, hey, church, practice hospitality without grumbling. <laughs> That's why he has to tack on that without grumbling because it's, oh, do we have to have somebody over? Do we need, blah, blah, blah. But we need to realize here that he says, show hospitality to strangers. Listen, it's going to be natural to show hospitality to people you know, but how about having over somebody you don't know? How about welcoming a new guest at the church? Or I see so many of you doing that different times throughout uh, services. Let's, Let's create that culture where it's natural for us to welcome strangers and say, hey, I don't know, you've been around here a while. Would you like to come over for a meal? Promise not to keep you long and we won't grill you at the kitchen table. You can just eat with us and we'll talk and get to know you. So that would be a great thing. Just, but in, and the writer says, don't neglect to do that. Don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Strangers is not just strangers here in the body of Christ, but it's also unbelievers and those who are outside of the body of Christ. Don't neglect to show hospitality to them as well. And then the great promise is, you never know what might happen through that. Some have entertained angels unaware, Genesis 18. And it says, remember those who are in prison. It's so easy to forget those, out of sight, out of mind, right? We're so prone to that. And yet the writer says, just look, remember those. You don't see them. They're off. They're struggling. They're suffering. But I want you to think as though you were in prison with them. Now, this was very real to the Hebrews. Look back at chapter 10. This was very real. Some of them were, were in prison and going to prison. We read in chapter 10, verse 32, But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and abiding one. Oh my. These Christians knew, as many of our brothers and sisters do in Muslim nations or nations where Christianity is not only a minority but a persecuted minority, to identify with, the, with a Christian makes you a target as just as those Christians were. And these Christians were being persecuted and they were sitting in prison and the church was sitting back and they say, look, if we go, if we go and see them in prison, they're all going to see us. They're all going to know we're, we're Christians too. So do we go or not? They went. And they joyfully accepted the plundering of their property as a result. How did they do that? They looked at all that property, their houses being ransacked because they were Christians, and they said, you know what? I got a better possession and an abiding one. That stuff ain't going with me to heaven. My home is in heaven. And that's what what got them through that. And he says in verse 35, Therefore, don't throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. So, 
Number two, God, a God-pleasing church cares for the needy. We'll spend less time on these last three. Number three, a God-pleasing church values marriage and God's view of sexuality. Look at verse four. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Adulterous. Now, brothers and sisters, this seems to be really clear um, as an address to the, to the local church here that the writer to the Hebrews is writing to. He's writing to the church, and he's telling the church to honor marriage. Now, you would think you wouldn't have to tell the church that, right? You would think, no, people who aren't honoring marriage are in the culture. That's where all the marriage fighting is going on, and that's where all the, you know, all the breakdown of marriage and redefinition of marriage is happening. Brothers and sisters, what undermines marriage in the church is not the assaults on marriage in the culture. It's the unbiblical marriages in the church. It's treating marriage with indifference instead of investment, with neglect instead of honor. There are no doubt serious problems to honoring marriage within our culture. And we are not responsible, first and foremost, to see that marriage is honored in the culture. We are first, now we should work toward that, no doubt, because that's, that contributes to human flourishing and we don't want to see families break down and all that and we know that the, the societal ramifications and personal ram, neighbor love demands that we care about honoring marriage in the culture. But our first and primary responsibility is to make sure marriage is held in honor among the people in the church. Now this doesn't mean that everyone is married in the church, clearly. Um, it, but it does mean that marriage as an institution is held in honor and the marriage bed is undefiled. We'll get to that part in a second. Now, there's no doubt serious problems to honoring marriage within the culture. These would include things like pornography and the objectification of women and hookup culture and the, the deifying of the Victoria's Secret and the GQ bodies and the spousal attention deficit and workaholism and childolatry and cohabitation without covenant and the ease and no big dealness of divorce and the redefinition of marriage altogether. But brothers and sisters, loveless, unfaithful marriages within the church do far more damage to the church than what's happening in the culture. Now, this is why I was thankful to read a couple of days ago, not sure if Jeremy or brother Jeremy Bennett sent this out um, or if Brad Rhodes sent it out, but it came from Grace Marriage and I want to share some insights that Brad had shared in an email just a few days ago about the importance of investing and holding our marriages in honor. Uh, Brad mentioned seven reasons why people file for divorce. Those are, number one, money, two, poor communication, three, lack of sex, four, marrying the wrong person, five, selfishness, six, loss of personal identity, and seven, saying I found my true soulmate. But instead of succumbing to those reasons or those desires to, to file for divorce, we can rather work to honor marriage and cultivate our marriages, keeping them vibrant and strong. And Brad offers seven words of counsel for how to do that. He says, first, get grace. He says, realize that your spouse is profoundly imperfect, and so are you, and you are just in need of grace as they are, and so when spouses decide to love each other despite their faults, as opposed to holding faults against one another, then it sets the marriage free. So for the believer in Jesus, we need to offer the same grace and forgiveness to each other, to our spouses, as we get from God. Number two, spend time together. Gottman studies show that if a couple spends five hours of undistracted time together each week, they're typically in the top 3% of marital satisfaction. That's crazy. It seems like what you reap is really what you sow. Number three, express gratitude. Thriving couples typically choose to dwell on the good in one another. For most of us, we have plenty of good traits and plenty of bad ones. So the couples who focus on the good actually like each other. Shockingly, they don't get on each other's nerves as much. What you focus on will often determine your attitude. Number four, they reject porn and prioritize sex. Pornography is one of the primary enemies of a good sex life and marriage. It rewires the brain, fuels selfishness, hijacks intimacy, distorts expectations, and introduces dysfunction. Five, adopt a rescue mentality. 
a rescue mentality is going to war in prayer and service and blessing to help your spouse out of a ditch. We all have seasons of struggle. It could be anxiety, anxiety, depression, fatigue, or a health issue. So when these times hit, they're not usually pretty. And if your spouse hits a tough season, then you can take an offense mentality or you can take a rescue mentality. And Brad is saying that instead of taking an offense mentality that just gets ticked or responds negatively, rather take a rescue mentality and go to war for your spouse, not against your spouse. Number six, talk. If spouses are authentic and vulnerable with one another, a unique closeness is obtained. This takes a willingness to share and a willingness to, to be a safe and non-condemning place for your spouse to share. Take 30 minutes each night, Brad says, letting your guard down and sharing everything with one another. And then number seven, he says, proactively invest. Everything takes ongoing attention to thrive. And I think this is exactly what he means by honor in Hebrews 13.4, that when we honor something, we give it unique and special attention. And so we, in our marriages, brothers and sisters, those of us who are married, need to make sure that we are giving our marriages unique and proactive investment so that we can, and that will, do a, that will go a long way in helping marriage not just be held in honor among our church, but in honor in the culture. Because what the culture needs to see is vibrant Christian marriages to see that marriage really is more than just the old ball and chain. We need to change the narrative. So the church's best opportunity then to encourage a biblical ethic of marriage and sex is by living out a biblical ethic of marriage and sex. The Christian witness cannot be in word alone. It has to be in deed. We have to embody what we're talking about. Rather than condemning sex in the city, we need to make it our chief ta task to be a city on a hill that Jesus intended. So to start, we have to remove the planks in our own eyes, whatever, wherever they may, may exist. We have to forsake porn habits. We have to take captive thoughts and fantasies that objectify God's image. We have to reduce unbiblical divorces. We also have to nurture fidelity and forgiveness, hand-holding and lingering conversation, living face-to-face -face in intimacy and side-by-side -side on mission. And this is why we encourage you to participate in things like grace marriage so that you can take that sort of intentional investment. But we also, brothers and sisters, we need to recover the beauty of chaste singleness as well, as vital to the Christian church. See, what if we reaffirm that being unmarried and chaste, like Paul and Jesus, is a noble and fruitful calling and not a curse? What if we reaffirmed that the call to singleness is far better since it frees people to devote themselves fully to God's concerns? What if we embraced a renewed vision for the church as a surrogate family where everyone finds opportunity for spiritual friendship as deep as David and Jonathan? Most significantly, what if we renewed our emphasis on the marriage of which all others are a shadow and of which we sang about so loudly this morning, the mystical union between Jesus and his bride, the church, which is the point of all marriage anyway. So no matter our temporary marital status on earth, Union with Christ through faith makes you as married and complete as you'll ever be. From the moment we believe Jesus is our bridegroom and we are his bride and we are our beloveds and our beloveds is ours. And this is why the, the church is a wonderful place where both singles and married people love each other for Christ's sake because we all realize that we're married to one person anyway. <laughs> Ultimately, the Lord Jesus Christ. Number four. A God-pleasing church trusts God, not money. A God-pleasing church trusts God, not money. Verse 5 and 6. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. See, having wealth, money, or not having wealth is never really a chief concern for Jesus. Many rich people in the Bible had great faith. Think of it. Abraham, Joseph, the prime minister of Egypt, he had a few bucks by that point. Job, the wealthy sufferer. David, the king of Israel. Solomon, the son of David. Luke, the physician. Joseph of Arimathea, the financer. <laughs> and eventually, Nicodemus, the wealthy pillar of his community, just to name a few. So what matters to Jesus, though, is where we locate our treasure. 
The Bible never says that having wealth is a problem. It's wealth having you that's the problem. It's desiring and serving wealth. It never says that money is the root of all kinds of evil, but the love of it. We aren't told that it's impossible to have God and money at the same time, but we are told that it's impossible to love money and love God at the same time. So money sickness or greed is acquainted with an inordinate love for money, not the possession of it. Greed is not about having money as much as it's about money having us. Possessing power and luxury only becomes problematic when possessing power and luxury begins to possess us. Success in the world's eyes, wealth and fame and beauty and power and love and romance and comfort and popularity and health and so on can be something to celebrate and enjoy with thanksgiving, but this is true only so long as we don't turn this kind of success into our lifeline, our source of significance or basis for meaning or our true north in life. Now, brothers and sisters, this ain't easy. This ain't easy. Because Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. Some of the world's wealthiest people have experienced letdown when they hit their coveted number. (laughs) The number to which they were shooting for all their lives. Having made billions of dollars in the oil industry, John D. Rockefeller was once asked how much money was enough. You know what his answer was? One more dollar. One more dollar. Or there's the great quarterback Tom Brady who after winning three Super Bowls, marrying the world's top supermodel, and having a household income of $76 million per year, said that this couldn't be all that there is. There had to be something more. Actor and comedian Jim Carrey said, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they've ever dreamed so that they can see that's not the answer. End quote. See, brothers and sisters, Jesus is the answer to our quest for safety and validation, not money. When a healthy relationship with money turns into a fixation upon or controlling fears about money, when enjoyment of material things turns into materialism, then our souls shrink and we are empty. When our souls derive safety and validation from Jesus, though, which is what Hebrews is telling us to do, We take on his generous, self-giving love. We don't hoard money, and we don't spend it all on ourselves, but we develop habits of joyfully giving it away. We spend it on the flourishing of others. See, treating Jesus as our truest treasure will lead us to, yes, avoid unnecessarily heavy and burdensome debt, give generously to God and to the poor and to people in need, to save for the benefit of future generations, to pay the taxes that we owe, to provide for those who are depending on us for care in our family and our basic needs. But we'll also hold everything else loosely, no longer desperately tightening our grip. And yet when we loosen our grip on these things, our loving Jesus sometimes has a way of giving them all back to us and an even greater and more healthy measure than ever before. And Jesus said that if we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, then all these things will be added to us as well. Now, this isn't some sort of health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. No, it's just saying that the way to gain our lives is to lose it. The way to become full and rich in the truest sense is to pour ourselves out and generously give, as Jesus modeled for us in Philippians 2. See, Jesus left heaven and became poor, for our sakes, as 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says. But then he became immeasurably and eternally rich as a result of that. And what does he do with it? He shares it with all of us for all of eternity. So we are to go and do likewise. The way to become the kind of person who does the most for the present world is to think most of the next. Now, Johnny Erickson Tata tells a great story about a worship service in poor remote village in Ghana, West Africa. She said that the most joy and laughter-filled moment of her time there in the church service was when it was time for the offering. The congregants who were among the very poorest of the world's poor found joy in releasing and entrusting whatever small amount they possessed into the hands of God. They had so much joy. It became clear to Johnny that it was not in spite of, but because of their lack of wealth that they had such joy. 
During the service, a woman stood up to welcome Johnny and her friends and was led to say these words, Welcome to our American friends to Ghana, where we have joy because we need Jesus more. See, everything minus Jesus really does equal nothing, but Jesus plus nothing really does equal everything. With Jesus, every other person, place, or thing we are given to enjoy is bonus, not something to plug our emotional umbilical, umbilical cords into, but rather something to offer thanks to God for. As the poor cottage woman in, in Charles Spurgeon's book, The Treasury of David, said, as she broke a piece of bread and filled it and put it inside a glass of water to eat, she said, what, all this and Jesus Christ too? See, brothers and sisters, we need to pray and ask that the Lord would rearrange the price tags in our lives about what really is valuable and about what really is worth pouring our heart and soul into. The Lord has said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. The Lord is our helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? No amount of money can buy you those promises. No amount of money. But the Lord offers them to us, and therefore we can handle money rightly because we have promises like that. Fifthly and finally, a God-pleasing church respects its leaders. A God-pleasing church respects its leaders. Look at verse 7. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Also look at verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Now we get to the selfish part of the sermon, right? Where Pastor Mark gets to preach about all the ways the church needs to be honoring me. No, we're not going to go that direction. No, but it's in the Bible, so we're going to talk about it. <laughs> Three times in this final chapter, the author addresses the subject of those who lead the church. He says, remember those who rule over you. Verse 7, obey and be submissive to those who rule over you. Verse 17, and then he says in verse 24, to greet them. See that? Greet all your leaders and all the saints. He says that we are to do all this because, verse 7, they speak the word of God to us. 7, they provide an example for us to follow. Verse 17, they watch out for our spiritual well-being. They will give an accounting to God. And they, sh they should be able to serve with joy and not grief. It will be unprofitable to us if they don't do so. Now, I want to camp out here in conclusion. We've given a lot of motivations. This, this passage has a ton of motivation in it. There's a lot of commands too, right? There's love each other and care for the needy and honor your marriage and, 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 and don't trust God, not money, and respect your leaders. But there's so much motivation built into this. I just want you to see it. Okay, so number one, let brotherly love continue. Now you say, there's no motivation there. Well, look back at the previous verse. Remember, the original letter doesn't have chapter divisions. Okay, so he's building it off of verse 28. Let us, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that can't be shaken. See, so that's the motivation for letting brotherly love continue. But then he says in verse 2, don't neglect to show hospitality. Why? Because some have entertained angels unawares. Verse 3, remember those who are in prison. Because you're also in the body. See, you're a part of the church too. So there's motivation there. Verse 4 is, kind of gives the negative motivation. Let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. There's the warning, but that's motivation too. See, it's not just motivated by, hey, you're receiving a kingdom that can't be shaken, but also, hey, God's a consuming fire. So there's both kindness and severity as motivation. Verse 5 Keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have because God has said, I won't leave here forsake you. So again, motivation. You say, well, where's the motivation to remember your leader or remember and honor and obey and be submissive to your leaders? Well, look at verse 17 again. It says, let them do this with joy and not with groaning for that would be of no advantage to you. See, the ultimate end of all this is your all's joy, is the church's joy. See, people, the writer says, of the church, seek the joy of your leaders. Seek the joy of your pastors. Respond to them, work with them, so as to minimize their groaning and maximize their joy. 
But here's what's so striking. The writer makes it explicit why they should do this. Why they should try to make the ministry of their pastors a joyful one, not a groaning one. He says at the end of the verse, let them do their ministry with joy and not with groaning for or because that would be of no advantage to you. (laughs) What an amazing argument. In other words, seek the joy of your pastors because if you don't, then you won't have joy from their ministries. Their ministry will be of no advantage to you, so seek their joy for your joy. (laughs) That's the argument, and it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Seek their joy for your joy. So the flock has a duty and privilege to joyfully receive the care of their shepherds, and we're ordinary guys with our own sins and struggles, but under the loving leadership of elders, we receive the ministry of Christ himself. I'm under elders too, three of them, and a chief one named Jesus. All of your elders are under elders, which is the beauty of plurality. We all, we all are shepherded. That's why I love being called a brother just way more than I love being called a pastor. I appreciate the pastor, but I'm way more thankful I'm a Christian. Brother, a sheep. Because before we can receive our elders' ministry, we have to identify as their flock. And this means that church membership is important. Publicly joining a church. The Apostle Peter reminds the fellow elders in in, uh, 1 Peter 5 that they have a duty to watch over those who are in their charge. The particular people that Christ has entrusted to their care. Your pastors aren't responsible for all the Christians in the world. Responsible for the Christians that have covenanted to be a part of this body. We're not the flock of God in some general abstract way. We're particular sheep in a particular section of the flock under particular shepherds. And by joining a local church, we submit ourselves to the leadership of those shepherds so that they can know and care for us and that we both can be enriched and joy in the Lord as a result. So in conclusion, let me leave us with these questions and then we'll pray and come back to this passage, Lord willing, next week. In his book for elders, Timothy Whitmer Whitmer describes the fourfold ministry of shepherds. He says, shepherds are to know, feed, guide, and protect. Know the sheep, feed the sheep, guide the sheep, protect the sheep. So as sheep, we should ask ourselves if we're receiving this willingly. Do you allow yourself to be known by your shepherds, committing yourself as a member of a local church and being transparent with your elders about the concerns of your soul? Do you receive nourishment from your shepherds, eagerly attending their preaching and teaching and seeking out their biblical counsel one-on-one? Do you follow the guidance of your shepherds, putting into practice what they teach you from the word and supporting them as they make decisions concerning life of the church? And finally, do you gladly place yourself under the protection of your shepherds, taking seriously their warnings against sin and false teaching and allowing them to rescue you if you wander into spiritual danger? Tell you what, if you do those things, you will be a joy to all of your pastors. If you allow us to know you and feed you and guide you and protect you, that's all we want as your shepherds. So let me conclude with what Paul says to the church in 1 Thessalonians, and then we'll pray. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 and 13, Paul writes, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful to you for your clear instruction in your word that you not only give us clear verses like Hebrews 13 that explain our obligations to you as your followers and as your children, but also you give us so much grace and motivation to do these things. It's not just, you don't come to us and say, hey, do it because I said so, although you are God and you have every right to do that. But you come to us and you say, hey, let brotherly love continue, care for the needy, care for your marriages, Don't love money. Respect your leaders because I want to give you joy. I want to make that of great advantage to you. I want to make your life full of my blessing and my presence. So, Lord, we are grateful for every word that comes from the mouth of our God, and we want to eat and digest these things that you have taught us this morning and pray that in the coming days they will bear much fruit for the glory of Jesus and our eternal good. We ask this in his name. Amen. Let's stand together and respond in song.